This is Elton Brown, former Arizona Cardinal, two-time All-American at the University of Virginia, and you're watching Legacy Maker Sports Network. Legacy Maker, the All Sports Network. Welcome to Commonwealth Sports Talk, Season 5, Episode 9, with your host, Joe Dillard Jr. Today's special guest, Maurice Hutton, MVP League founder and South County track and field head coach. Welcome to Commonwealth Sports Talk, as we have Season 5, Episode 9. We're bringing you Maurice Hutton, South County head track and field coach. MVP league, track director and coach. This guy is track and field 101, lives it, breathes it, loves it. We're going to tune in to him and let him talk about what it takes to be a supreme athlete. This podcast is designed to spread knowledge, teach and inform the listener and viewer about the positive advancement of Virginia athletes born or raised, and definitely born and raised. So as we tune in to season five, episode eight, this podcast is brought to you by Legacy Maker, Brian and Prey, and yours truly at Commonwealth Sports Talk. Let's jump right into it. Welcome to Commonwealth Sports Talk as we have Season 5, Episode 8. We're bringing you a track and field edition as we have South County coach, MVP, head coach, director, Maurice Hutton, how you doing, Coach? Joe, what's going on? What's going another, on? Another day in paradise, as I always say. So I, I just want to I just want to congratulate you first and foremost on, on winning a state title. Um, a lot of times people kind of expect greatness, but at this time when I saw you all throughout the year, take me through how the journey began and how you got to this point of the young ladies believing in themselves and winning uh that six A state title. Well, the first thing was always developing a culture and having them to believe in themselves, to understand that they had the capabilities, but they had to do the work. You know, so the only place work comes before success is in a, is in a dictionary, right? Success comes is in a dictionary. So we had to make sure that they understood what the expectation was, how we were going to get there, and what we needed to do to do it. That's perfect, man. Like, a lot of times that goes unspoken for when you have talent. They, they got that expectation, but... You don't just show up to the big dance and do it. There's a process oh, to it. The you best know? team doesn't always win. Exactly, exactly. And so the MVP league and the importance of proper training, is that kind of a thing that you just consistently spew? Like that? that's that's the way of living I'm hearing. Is that correct? Um, we put a big focus on making sure that our training environment is modern. It's really cutting edge. We're focused on really using the latest tech, the latest training, sports physiology method, methods are always above board with our com with our competition. So if you come out to our practice one day, it'll look like something you wouldn't even imagine. But we take pride in everything. It takes us about an hour to set up for practice. So our practice starts at 8, we're there at 7 o'clock. And when they show up at 8, we're still putting the finishing touches on getting set up. But once they get, get there and we get rolling, it's something special. So you've got like all the electrical equipment as far as uh, per enhancing performance, trying to set bars as far as timers. You've got it all out there for them to get the maximum effort out of every practice and yeah. rep they got. Yeah, we use a stat sports GPS vest um, yeah. to really get like collect a lot of metrics on every run. We use heart rate monitors. We use 
timing gates, laser timing gates. Um, we're in the process of getting some contact grids so we can get some more information on how we're reacting to the ground and what and what we need, what areas of opportunity we have, especially with bounding and reactive strength indexes and def different things like that. Yeah, that's very smart. A lot of people overlook that with bounding and the impact of the body and how it affects you per per workout. You know, yep. it's it helping more. When does it stop helping? When does it start hurting? Just learning that balance is definitely something that's important. Um, uh, definitely. So, Will you, go ahead. No, go ahead, man. It's on you. No, I was saying we use the whoop with all our athletes. Yeah. So they use the whoop. Um, Heart, heart monitors to check the heart rate variability, heart rate variability. But what it really does for us is allows us to know when it's too much, how far we've gone, is the athlete ready to work again, or do we need more time to recover? A lot of times we'll come out to the track and I'll check the team metrics, and we may have uh, an acceleration day lined up. But I look at the team and we're operating still in the red, so it has to turn into an active recovery day. But we take the guesswork out of it because we're looking at those metrics and we're looking at the heart rate variability for our core players. And we may not have the resources to put them on every player, but we collect enough data from a, from a sample size of athletes. So if I got 50 athletes and I'm monitoring six to 10 of them, that kind of paints a good picture for what the other 40 who may not be wearing the whoop are, um, are experiencing as well because they're all going through the, the same stimulus and the same um, the same training modality. So we really take pride in analyzing the data. And I put a lot of pressure on our coaches. I put a lot of pressure on some coaches. Um, tech, before I got on here with you, I was just on the phone with three of our strength coaches. And I'm just like, what's going on with this? And what's going on with this? And what are we doing about this? And how are we going to fix this? And what's the game plan for this? Like, we don't leave any. There's no luck in this game. Luck is for leprechauns. Oh, God, I love you saying that. I love you saying that because you're taking the words right out of my – like, you're so meticulous. That was what I was going to say. I was like, the meticulous efforts, the 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 breaking down every variable possible to gain an advantage, um, never taking any rep for granted. Like, nope. that's what develops champions and winning cultures. So, like, I'm glad you were bringing that out. Like, that's, that's dope, bro, because essentially – that's what is bleeding through the program right now is expecting more. You right. may run and blink a couple of blinks. We all been in that August sun, that July sun when you blinking and then you just like, man, I need to come back. That's a barrier that we're talking about exceeding and, and not mm -hmm. necessarily in a negative way, but like more like just finding your, your, your balance and then how to push it and then how to gain that, that strength from each level of, 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 of of, of you know breakdown development essentially whether if it's foot speed whether if it's conditioning whether if it's strength whether if it's endurance you're just breaking all that down like a big yeah. mad scientist I'm seeing huh yeah I think having having really tangible KPIs for every session and then being able to show the athlete the progression like if we're doing a 10 meter fly with a 10 meter run in and I wanted that 0.96 meters per second if you're at 1.1 in the year 1.09 in the year 1.06 we don't have to wait until december to figure out if we're getting better or not and i think for athletes if they can see it's just like the weight room in football players if i bench 225 yep. this week but now i bench 250 that that progress feeds the feeds that competitive nature it feeds them to keep working hard it feeds them to stay motivated so you know having really good kpis like we do a five bound test um, we may put it against speed and we come up with our own terminology for some of this stuff. But being able to say, OK, this is where we were in September. This is where we are in October. This is where we are in November. When we get to December, the expectation, the confidence in the work that we've done, it exudes when they get there. They get there. They're ready. They're just they're just hopped up, ready to go. They just can't wait to showcase the work as opposed to getting to December. A lot of people come into December and they're like, all right, let's see where we're at, see what we need to work on. No, they come to December ready to showcase, like they're ready to hit the ground running. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've always had some of the top performances in the country every December for the last two or three years. Um, that's so, yeah. Dope. That's, 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 you know something, though? That's that's like that effort of them wanting more. That's what the new kids say these days. Like it, it doesn't matter what sport you put it to. When you have a glimmer of intelligence or information or knowledge that they may want, 
they're going to want it now. And, and, and whether they know why or not, they're going to know that they want it now. And so for you to be able to provide that information readily over and over again to see the progression, because what people don't realize that ain't in track and field, you're on your own. You, okay. you, you got to put the work in. And if you don't put the work in, it shows, you know, it's, absolutely. it's pretty self-explanatory there in that realm. So for somebody to want to push themselves consistently, that's the type of environment you want to breed good athletes out of. And so I, I commend you for that one. Um, so talk to me about this South County experience. You had a leader, Victoria Higgins, 200 winner, 400 winner, part of the four by four state she's on her way to college how was that journey building her development how she matured into what she's become today so the victoria higgins story is a pretty amazing one a lot of which we can't really talk about here but she's okay. overcome so much and just to watch her grow and develop might have been one of the most rewarding experiences you can have as a coach you know people they go on and they look at, oh, Victoria won the 400 at the state meet. She ran 55 seconds. But did they go and look at the fact that she came in last in 2022 and she ran 61, 62 seconds? So just to say, OK, here we are a, a year later. like, um, And that's what a lot of coaches miss. Like development and progressions are not always going to be linear. Sometimes they're going to go up. They're going to come down. They're going to go yes. up again. And you've got to understand that there's, there's a lesson in Every one of those, we learn more from failures than we do success. And I tell my kids that all the time. Like, all the time, brother. Uh, like, you don't learn a lot when you're constantly winning. And you learn a lot about yourself more than anything. And then you learn, and even for yourself as a coach, like, sometimes we get it wrong. And sometimes we've got to go back and, and be okay with saying, okay, where did I go wrong? And what could I have done differently? And how could we have better prepared for this for this situation so working with victoria to kind of get back with her man she had came to us um as a high school sophomore she had a long list of injuries her freshman year she had messed up her quad she had messed up her hip um she didn't really she didn't compete that much she was overcoming a lot of injuries and you know her sophomore year she was maybe a 63, 64 second quarter miler. She might have been a 26, 27 second girl, 27 second girl. Um, didn't really do anything that would make you say, hey, we need to train this girl. But she showed a lot of things that was like, you know what? I think she has some tools in the toolbox that we can work with. And being able to say, OK, you know, I've loved those coaching challenges. Like it, we always talk about the Aaliyah Pius of the world, but I love the Victoria Higgins. I love the Emily Catledge, the kids that typically don't fit the mold. You don't, they come, they went, where did this kid come from? They come out of nowhere and they just blow the doors off the, off the track me and being able to go through that journey with her was pretty amazing. When, you know? when did the, when did the, uh, when did the light bulb click on for her? Was it a meet or something when both of y'all looked at each other and said, hey? Yeah. It, it, you know, I don't remember the exact meet, but it was this season. She sent me a text message, and I could probably go back to my phone and find it. Yeah. She's just like, I get it now. Mm-hmm. It kind of it kind of went on. Because, you know, you, you try to be – I forget the guy's name um, – Jamie Foxx played his character in, in the Ali movie. No. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you try to be that 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 guy for, for all your kids. Like, you're the best champ. You know, gotta, nobody gotta, can mess you with you. You got to hype them up, man. You got to get them ready. And at some point, if they don't start experiencing success, they start looking at you like, you just gassing me up. And they, they nope. start thinking, you just telling me what I – you just telling me what you think I, I want to hear, Coach. Like, you just right. talking. So, you know, they, ha they, they, ha they have to actually experience some success before they start to truly believe you because they believe you, but they're working and they're not experiencing success. They're working and they're not experiencing success. Then they start to question you like, you said if I did this, I would be this. Yeah. Why am I? Why am I not this? And that's why you got to yeah. be very, you got to be careful with kids too. And with athletes in general, you got to make sure that you're managing expectations. You got to make sure that you have very tangible targets. 
Correct. Kid, don't 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 tell this kid that they're gonna go from sixty one seconds and run fifty three seconds. No, our goals were sixty one to sixty. Then when we ran fifty nine, we were trying to run fifty eight. Then we ran fifty eight, we were trying to run, we were trying to run fifty 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 seven, and we just worked our way down. And you know, you oh, you know, what? I do remember where it was. It was after the Nike Indoor Nationals. That's what it yeah. was, because she had ran a terrible prelim. I mean, it was by any by her standards, it was just not good. She got the last spot in to the finals, and then she comes back and runs almost a second, second and a half PR the next day. And mm-hmm. you know, it was kind of like that uh, moment, like you just got to do it this way. You can't do it that way. If you do it this mm-hmm. way, it's gonna work. And mm-hmm. you know. She was a little soft through the first 200 in her prelim race and didn't quite run as fast as she had liked. And she was kind of down on herself. So we had to, like, spend some time to bring her back around and get her. Absolutely. It's a part of the game. It's not over. The game's not over. We got to get back in there. We got it's just halftime right now. You know, So when you when you have when you run rounds in track and field, you have that those unique opportunities, kind of like field sports or court sports where you can kind of go back and look at the replay or look at what just happened and kind of re-strategize, come up with a new game plan, depending on who you're racing or who you're competing against. So we had that, we had that opportunity up at Ocean Breeze at the Nike Indoor Nationals and she capitalized on it. And, you know, it was interesting because, you know, this girl, I don't want to say her name because I don't want to speak badly about any kids, but this girl was that she competed against was an amazing athlete. And this girl had beat her every year for three years every time they ran and then this one time she beat her at the nike meet and she never beat her again that was it the moment finally clicked for her like all right i am who coach said i am and she had lost this girl every race for three years they met up and now she after that one time she had never beat her again she had full awakening on her so so she came full circle like all right i am who you say i am and she there every race and she was tested at every round i think she might have had one of the toughest pathways um Mm -hmm. to the state meet if you took away the standards because you know it took 55 seconds to win the regional meet it took 24 low to win to win the district meet Mm -hmm. so you know i mean she had some great competitors that were never going to take a day off they were they, they were always gonna push the race to to the to the to be at a high level every single time and you had to show up every single round. And I think that kind strength, of made made her better. How much strength is required? Most people don't realize this. They don't know the track order of a meet. How much strength is required to win the 200 and the 400? Immense amount of strength. I mean, you don't you do not do that double. Um, first of all, the recovery time is not that long. Thank you. Know, you. you, you it, it is a tough double to begin with because when you come back to run that 200, um first you first you gotta run a 200 prelim before you run the four. Correct. On day one. So you're not even coming into the 400 fresh. You already have day one on your legs, you're already a little sore, you're already a little nicked up. And then you gotta run a high level 400. And then you gotta come back in about 60 to 90 minutes, depending on the day, and and run a 200. And you've got to run a 200 against the hundred meter state champ, <laughs> like you, 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 who just so happened to be her teammate, but it's like you, you get, you, you just faced the toughest quarter milers, and now you got to turn around and face the toughest, two of the toughest hundred meter runners because she had to run Catania Sanchez and Kira Bumont from Hayfield, who mm-hmm. were two kids that just they like, they wanted to win just as bad as anybody else on that track, so they weren't going to lay down and give you anything. If mm-hmm. you wanted it, you were going to have to take it. Mm-hmm. Point right. blank, period. Yeah. And then she just had to really dig deep and, and push through. But I think they're all great competitors. I think they're all going to do well later la- later on in the sport. I think there's a bright future, especially for those young ones there. Well, that's they- a good thing there, how it just the comp- competitive drives continue to push you to be better. Like right. That's something that, and, and I'm not saying that it may happen, but Catalina as a freshman is going to have to continue to find that, that search for that one, being a freshman hitting the, the echelon. You know what I mean? Like some people have these, everybody has their own version of how they get to their peak or when they're at their prime. However, when you've got an early task of goals that you've accomplished, you got to now set some new goals. You got to buckle down even more, almost as if you, you 
call it an injury year. It's not even a state title year because now everybody's looking at you. Everybody wants to see you run. Everybody wants to be against you, and everybody wants to be the one to beat you. So it's almost a double down that you have to come back and repeat. So I know that 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 energy has got to be a competitive drive to do something like that. You know what I mean? To keep that muster going, to keep that kind of drive as a freshman going into your sophomore year. No, a hundred percent. I think that's where the league kind of complements this whole thing, because Correct. it's funny. It's funny we talked about that in practice today that um. Our practices are our state championship every every day. You know, any day you kind of practice, she's got to line up against Lanessa Whitaker, who's who's on the top sprinters in the state. She's had to line up against Leah Pyatt. You know, she or this, this summer we're training and our college kids are home. So you got to line up against kids from the SEC, the Big Ten, the Pac-12, as well as some of the top level high school kids every practice, every day. So I think as coaches, it's important for us to create an environment that allows athletes to continue to grow. Yeah, you, know, you got to say that again because if you don't, it, I will. It, it, it's our it's, it's it's our job to create the environment that allows the athletes the opportunity to grow. So as we're oh. putting together the schedule for this upcoming season, you know, our schedule is pretty much done, and our schedule is you know taken into consideration for there's certain kids that need to compete at a high level. And in order for them to compete at a high level, we've got to get out of our small pond. You know, we're going right. to have we're, we're going to have to move around. We're going to have to take some losses. We're going to have to go run against the best because in order to be the best, you got to beat the best. Right. You can't just say, hey, I, I won here. So I'm the I'm the best. No, you got we got to go to Texas. We got to go to Tennessee. We got to go to New York. We got to go to wherever they are to get the best out of them, to get the best effort that we could possibly get. And, you know, I think that's going to really pay dividends more long term for some of the goals that she has she has some big goals and absolutely not my job to say these goals are too big i think coaches sometimes they kind of um i hear a lot of coaches dial kids back and, and to some degree i get it but you know it's okay to dream for the moon so hey it's all right if we land on the stars mm -hmm. so it's okay to dream for the moon so if your dream is to get to the moon I, i'm going to do anything I possibly can to get you to the moon. And if we don't get there, we don't get there, but we're not going to get there because of a lack of, a lack of effort and intention. You definitely got to enjoy the process because landing in the stars ain't no, ain't no slouch. You ain't know no. what I'm saying? And yep. so if you don't realize that you didn't reach certain ele elevated levels, you know, then what was you reaching for the moon anyway for if you don't appreciate every stride that it takes to get there? 100%. 100%. Man, I tell you, it's, it's got some gems in there with that one. Where did it all come from? I heard you mention New York. Where, where did where did the first 400 meter track or indoor track or was it in the streets running or was you a bad kid chased by the cops? I'm just <laughs> where did the first uh, a little bit of, a, a little bit from? a little bit of all of that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little, there's a little bit of all of that. A little bit of all of that, bro. There's, there's a little, all, little bit of all of that. Yeah. So okay. no. Um, well, where did you it, fall in love with it when you said, "Hey, I could do this forever"? Well, I always knew I wanted to be a coach. I didn't know I would want to do it forever, but I always knew I wanted to be a coach. Um, if you went back and talked to some of my high school teammates, I thought I was a coach when I was in high school. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, I was that guy on the team. Like I wanted to us to do as much as we possibly could to be as good as we probably could have been. So, um, but no, I come from Jamaica, you know, it's, it's a way of life. It's kind of like American football. Like this is a rite of passage here. And so we have prep school, not even on high school. We have elementary school championships that pack stadiums. I mean, it's unreal. Like we'll have thirty, forty thousand people show up, screaming, blowing horns. Make you can hear them for miles to Jamaica's watch. Jamaica's good. Eleven and twelve year olds. Jamaica's very good. You yeah. know that line. Yeah, <laughs> it's very so, good. So no, so um, you, you, it's kind of like we were. I was baptized in the sport. Like wow. it, it, you, 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 you had to. You had to eat, breathe, sleep, track. And food. We, 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 you guys play soccer, handball, basketball, football, dodgeball, an array of things in gym classes. 
in Jamaica, we ran track meets. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We long jumped for gym class, like you know, mm-hmm. like those, those. We high jumped for gym at class at the Olympics as your competitive juices. You know, we were running relays in in gym class, and, and they we were besotted things with field day. I'm sorry, but in America, we besotted things with field day. We need specialty elementary and middle uh, secondary schools, but that's another subject. But I hear where you're coming from, brother. What they do that what those what they did is kind of like what the Canadians do with hockey is they had a system in place for talent identification. And it was kind of like once you were pegged as the chosen one from that area, there was no more conversation. There was no, do you want to do this? It's no, you are going to do this. You are going to be here after school at X time. Whoever is coming to pick you up, we're going to let them know that you will not be ready for pickup at X time. They're going to have to come back at this time. And if you don't have, and if you can't do it, we're gonna figure a way out to make sure it gets done. That's just the way it was. That's awesome. They don't know about that, man. That's 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 a different was, train of thought. Oh yeah, and it's a different heat. <laughs> you know, it's a different yeah. environment. It's it's a better heat though. It's a better heat. But I it's tell hot. you what, though, I tell you what, that that love for it doesn't go far because you know I've run into you throughout last year. And it's just it's a it's a it's a it's a aura. It's a, it's an ambiance of the whole like hearing the gun, being back out there, seeing an athlete compete. It's a competitive gladiator type feeling sport, and people don't even think about it that way. But that's no. how I see you taking it. That's how I've started to take it. Like you really have to understand that that's a competitive environment. I no, think it might be the most competitive for young ladies. Now, I know other women in other sports are very competitive, but the young women I've had the privilege to coach and track, let me tell you, their competitive juices are just through the roof. And, so and they have to get better. A mentor of mine compared track and field to um to boxing mm. because the amount of emotions, I mean, it's not, it may not be as physical with the with the um direct aggression. But uh-huh. the amount of anxiety and just the arena and the stage, you know, it's it's just like boxing. Yes, it is. It's you versus me, and I'm trying to kick your butt, and you're trying to kick my butt. You know, I tell my kids all the time, and, you know, I've always been an advocate to play multiple sports. I never tell kids not to play multiple sports, but Very there are well. certain sports like um you can you can have the cleanest jersey, not see the field, and if we win, everybody jumps up and say we won. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen like that in track and field. Like mm-hmm. you don't you don't get a ring for riding for, for riding the bench. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't get a medal like okay, there's four by four once so everybody gets the medal. No, mm-hmm. just those four kids get a medal. Just mm-hmm. that one kid that ran a hundred gets a medal. Everybody does not get a get get a medal. Right, uh, there's no participation award for track and field uh, at, at, at the higher levels. It's not there. There, there, there's first, second, and third, and that's it. You know, I love you that have that analogy: track and field to boxing. I like that one because the show coming to the show also is required in boxing, just like track yeah. and field. You can yeah. run that eleven. What you can run blazing times. But if you ain't figured out your start, if you subject to the moment and you can't perform in the moment, nobody care about that no more. Nobody care about that speed. I learned that very early on when I was coaching um, at another coaching job I had. I had a girl, Leah Pyatt, um, when I was down at Massapontis High School. And we took her up to the to the New Balance Indoor Nationals her freshman year. She's in the freshman 400. We're coming around the first turns. Then they break. For the um, for lane one, mm-hmm. falls on the face, gets a concussion. Incredible athlete. She went on to run for the University of South Carolina. Now she's at the University of Arkansas. Incredible mm-hmm. athlete. But falls flat on her face, legs come up, has a concussion, out for two, three weeks. But why? Well, because we didn't prepare her for the moment. She had only done her local track meets, her districts, regionals, and states. So now we take her to the Mecca, we take her to New York, the bright lights, the loud stadium. There are a lot of emotions now, a lot of a lot of sensor things that are happening that that causes her to be off balance, off kill, off her game. And right. that's where to kind of circle back to what I said, our job as coaches 
to create the environment time and time again right. that best set the athlete up. People are like, oh, why are you going all the way out here? Why are you going all the way out here? Because I'm not looking to develop practice all Americans. I'm looking to develop all Americans. Mm -hmm. And the only way that become all Americans is that when we line up on the big stage for the big race, we run our best race. Yeah. And the only way we do that is by not being a stranger to the big stage. We got to get there. Got to get there. I love that. I've got a I've got a high school basketball experience since you call me the basketball guy a lot when we talk all the time. And we lost my first year as a varsity coach in the semifinals, but we had the lead and we blew it. That court turns from 60 something feet to 94 feet in the high school state basketball tournament. So it required an adjustment. So when we went the second year to go play, I put Virginia State in the Lawson Classic on our schedule play on that 94 foot court and you know what i did and a lot of people don't really recognize it i only played six kids so that they could understand how much 94 feet was and what it was going to feel like and we lost but we only lost by five but we lost and i talked to them and i said that's not that small high school gym you grew up in that's a bigger environment a bigger venue the I back knew that. backboards go far back you don't even see the wall it's a whole different way of shooting. So you you hit it right on the nail. You got to put them at grand stage, at center stage, if they want to be prepared for center stage. So a high school basketball court and a college basketball court not the same size? Nope. Never knew that. Hmm. And, that's, and, and that's something that, and I'm going to go right back in the track, as you know I would know, as we both know, the advantages of a high school female hurdler versus the male hurdler, where – and, you know, I don't want to say it like that and make it a he versus she thing, but the height of the high school female hurdle does not change ever. in the collegiate. Or ever. Freshman. You're right. Ever. 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 They run the same height since their high school freshman all the way to the Olympics. It took and me a whole year just to adjust to the height in college. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's a conversation for another day. But I think now that um we're seeing some things like, Someone's gonna go sub twelve seconds in those short hurdles, and we've been saying for years we've got we've got to raise these hurdles, and no one's listening. But you know, I think we've crossed the point of no return. We've got world records, so if you raise the hurdle, it becomes a new race and a new record, and, and everything. The yeah. old record becomes the the um, etched in stone because you, if you don't run that race anymore, it can no longer be broken. So you know Put now a lot you of have pressure on that open one to continue to lower its time because you know the one. One one hundred hurdles is gonna lower its time because of, of course, that height of the hurdle not really affecting the race by now. Once you yeah, get to the professional level. But I think we'll see more, and we are seeing more development in the hurdles, and it's starting to manifest itself at the highest levels. I think, you know, for years, um, high school coaches did the hurdles a disservice where they were mm -hmm. putting the kids that weren't as fast in the event and it's a complete opposite you need your most talented athletes to run the hurdles not your least talented so what you're seeing now is you know you're looking at the sydney mclaughlin's well she spent 49 seconds in high school so uh yeah she could run 50 point over the hurdles it's it's it's, it's no surprise nice. but you know you go back 5 10 15 years they weren't putting the sydney mclaughlin's in the hurdles they were saying okay you're great at the one, you're great at the two, you're great at the four, and that's what we're going to do. And we're going to yep. keep it there. They were never thinking, hey, we're going to take this phenom and put more on them. They were never doing that. And that's something that, you know, we have a great young group of kids as we try to do some long-term planning with our program. And, you know, we're working with some middle school age kids that have exhibited phenomenal talent. And right. I was talking to a dad the other day and he's like, yeah, we just came from the AU Junior Olympics and she finished third and she did this and she ran in the four by one. And I'm like, that's great. Well, now she's got to learn how to hurdle and now she's going to have to learn how to long jump. And now she's going to experience less success as we start going through these technical events and start teaching a different motor pattern and different, different sequencing and different things like that. So I hope she had a great time doing those things, but we're going to do less of that and Correct. more and more of this at to this, develop at this young, athlete and and to de just develop an athlete like you Correct. know I think we, I think we get away from the um the athlete part sometimes with track and field and you know a buddy of mine um coach 
um, JB over at um, Vanderbilt, he and I talked during the pandemic several times. We were hosting these Zoom talks, and he was like, people forget to develop athleticism in athletes. So I got this. 100%. I don't know what fire is going on right now, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so you've got to develop athleticism for athletes. And you do. You don't, then you're going to you, – you'll find that you start dealing with unnecessary injuries. You start hitting ceilings a lot earlier. They didn't want to. You start to plateau at different at times. You don't really want to. And that's because you've been so laser focused on trying to have this linear progression in development when it comes to speed that you've completely ignored the other, the other component to this thing. And it's just the overall athleticism of the athlete. And then it just comes in and manifests itself later. Like I tell people all the time, I've seen a ton of middle school, AEU, USATF, whatever you want to call it, junior Olympic, all Americans that can't make a state final or quit the sport because there was too much emphasis put on certain things very early on and they just ignored it. That's crazy, man. I, I think that that's something that is for a whole nother episode because that's that coaching 101. And that's that's taking care of them as if it was your own. You know what I mean? And, you know, I don't want to cut that short because that's definitely something that I would love to continue talking about. But it's just an honor to have your time on here because, you know, the success you're trying to groom, keep doing what you're doing, brother. Like. <laughs>